Well, it looks like greedy rail corporations who have been exploiting their employees for years now are going to win in this overall dispute that could lead to a rail worker strike because of the Biden administration essentially forcing workers to accept a subpar deal that they're not happy with, that most rail workers rejected. Now, this is really, I think, a pivotal moment for the Biden administration because he has claimed that he's the most pro-union president ever. But when push came to shove, he sided with the exploitative corporations as opposed to to the workers. So I want to give you a really robust picture of what's happening because it's very easy to get duped by propaganda. Because when we hear about the potential rail worker strike, there's always this fear mongering about the economy and how destructive that strike would be. And that's true. We'll get to that in a moment here. But the blame, it seems like Mainstream media wants to blame workers exclusively when the blame, if this strike does occur, rests squarely on the shoulders of these corporations who are exploiting their workers and trying to do everything to increase profits to the detriment of their workers' health and well-being. So basically, rail corporations have slashed their workforce by 29% over the course of the last couple of years, and they've increased profits. And what have they done with that money? Well, they've bought back their own stocks. Now, in the event they were slashing their workforce and increasing benefits for existing workers, that would be one thing. I mean, it's still pretty shitty because you're forcing workers to pick up extra slack because you're cutting costs, but they're not doing that. They're simply forcing their workers to do more all so they can increase shareholder value, all so they can make more money and get richer. It's just corporate greed, plain and simple. And as a result of them doing this, cutting the workforce, not only have they destroyed the morale for their workers, they've made them miserable. They don't have sick leave. They have been working so much hours that they don't even get to see their families. And on top of that, this has led to them exacerbating supply chain issues. It's increased inflation. So when corporations are doing this, when their greed is getting out of control, I think it's incumbent on the most pro-union president ever to rein them in. But that's not what's happening here. But before we get to that, the Biden administration did intervene to try to broker a deal between the rail corporations and the rail workers. But they decided to reject that deal because it doesn't address their core concern, which is paid sick leave and an overall quality of life improvement, because you can't keep working yourself to death and be happy like this is unsustainable but nonetheless these were the details of the tentative deal brokered by the biden administration as the prospect explains the september tentative agreement included a 24 percent pay raise by 2024 annual one thousand dollar bonuses and no increases to health care costs looked at alone those specific details are worthwhile but at the heart of the matter are attendance policies previous reporting has detailed how railroad workers have suffered mental and physical health decay due to erratic scheduling which prevents workers from attending medical appointments. Union leaders originally wanted 15 days of paid sick leave. After negotiations in September, they settled for one sick day while removing penalties for time missed due to illness or a medical emergency. So that last point there is crucial. They asked for 15 sick days and they got one in this tentative deal. Now, at face value, it sounds great because they're getting a pay increase, but not all worker rights issues have to do with pay. The quality of their lives is what's at stake here. And they're asking for better working conditions to where if they have to call in sick, they're not going to be penalized. And the penalties are seemingly going away. But one sick day means that if you're out of work for more than a day, you're SOL, you're shit out of luck. So ultimately, they rejected this deal. In These Times explains, the Brotherhood of Locomotive Engineers and Trainmen narrowly ratified the agreement with 53.5% of members voting in favor, while the deal was rejected by just over 50% of train and engine service members of the Sheet Metal Air Rail and Transportation Workers Transportation Division, Smart TD. Smart TD joins three other rail unions that voted down the tentative agreement, the BMWED, the Brotherhood 
Brotherhood of Railroad Signalmen and the International Brotherhood of Boilermakers. Absent a new agreement, the four unions that rejected the deal, which together represent approximately 55% of the unionized U.S. rail labor force, are set to strike on December 9th. The BLET and the other eight rail unions that already ratified the deal have pledged to honor the picket lines should there be a work stoppage. The four unions poised to strike represent around 60,000 workers, and if members of other rail unions refuse to cross the picket line, the number of those not working could rise to over 115,000. In other words, while a majority of unions have accepted the deal, well, the smaller unions that rejected it represent the majority of rail workers. So this is significant. A majority of workers said no to this tentative deal that was brokered by the Biden administration. Now, in the event they were to strike, the media is correct that this would be catastrophic to the U.S. economy. It result in about $2 billion lost economic output per day and even affect U.S. water supply, as Truthout explains. But when you listen to the way that mainstream media pundits are talking about this, they're putting the burden and the culpability on the workers because they just see, oh, they're getting a pay raise and they're rejecting this. So they're the ones who are unreasonable, not these greedy rail corporations who are forcing their workers to work even if they're sick and offering them no sick days or more more than one sick day, rather. Um, so I just want to give you a small example. This is a quick clip. Uh, this is an interview with Michael Baldwin. He's the president of the Brotherhood of Real Race Signalmen. And listen to the way that the CNN anchor frames the situation to imply that the rail workers are the ones being unreasonable here. It is, though, these increases are higher than, than most American workers. National wage growth, uh, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, uh, wages and salaries increased about 5% for the 12 month period ending in September 22. This would, 2022, does not meet all your demands, but it's higher than most American workers are getting. Not everything has to do with money. Sure, in most negotiations between workers and corporations, yes, the crux of their concerns is pay. But in this instance, they're saying we're working so much that we can't live. We're missing doctor's appointments because we don't have sick leave. That's the crux of their concerns. But CNN and other news outlets, to be clear, this is just one example, but a microcosm of a bigger issue. They're essentially implying that if these workers do not accept this deal, which doesn't meet their demands, then they're the ones responsible for the potential economic destruction that a strike might cause. It's not the corporations who have increased their profits who refuse to offer sick time to their own workers. No, it's the workers who are the ones who should be blamed. That's the subtext if you read a lot of mainstream news articles about this. Now, Biden, obviously, as president, wants to see that the economy is not affected by this. So he has an interest in making sure that a deal gets approved. So what can happen here? Well, as Brett Wilkins of Common Dreams explains, under the Railway Labor Act of 1926, which critics have long slammed as anti-worker, Congress can pass a joint resolution that would force employees to stay on the job. By signaling such a measure, labor advocates say Biden would be betraying his claim, reiterated in Monday's statement, to be a pro-labor president. Now, what people don't know is is that, yes, Congress does have the power to effectively force these workers to not strike and to accept the subpar deal, even if they didn't agree to the terms. But the Biden administration can also call on Congress to pass a bill that is more favorable to workers. Believe it or not, they don't have to side with the corporations in this instance. They can side with the workers. And this is one of those instances where you absolutely should side with workers, given the fact that these rail corporations absolutely can afford to give their workers sick leave. As Bernie Sanders pointed out via Twitter, last year, the rail industry made a record-breaking $20 billion in profits after cutting their workforce by 30% over the last six years. Meanwhile, rail workers have zero guaranteed paid sick days. Congress must stand with rail workers. Furthermore, Bernie Sanders Majority Staff Director Warren Gunnels adds it would cost 680 eight million dollars to provide 15 days of paid sick leave to rail workers and prevent a lockout that would cost the economy two billion dollars a day buffett is the owner of bnsf rail and is worth 110 billion dollars so on its face 688 million dollars is a very large cost for a company and of course they're going to fight that but when you juxtapose that with the billions in profit that they made the, the previous year, how can you possibly say with a straight face that the workers are the ones being unreasonable here? So this is a turning point for the Biden administration. He has a choice to make. Will he side with workers or the greedy corporations who are screwing over their own employees? 
And you'd be shocked to learn that Biden chose to side with these corporations. In a White House statement, he's calling on Congress to adopt the tentative agreement that rail workers voted down, adding that a majority of unions in the industry approved of the deal, but leaving out the crucial fact that a majority of workers rejected the deal. And in a statement by Pelosi's office, she announced that the House will do just that with, quote, no poison pills or changes, meaning that there's not going to be any improvements to meet the needs of workers. And she also had the nerve to patronizingly refer to Biden as our proudly pro-union president after he royally screwed over rail workers at the behest of these greedy corporations. It's just insufferable. To me, when you look at the details here, this is an easy choice. You don't side with these corporations. If you want to stop a strike, you side with the workers because their demands here are reasonable. They just want quality of life improvements. They want 15 sick days. That's all that they're asking for. And they couldn't get that. And yet you're forcing them to accept a deal that isn't even meeting their most basic demands. Now, why would the president, who is supposedly the most pro-union president in American history, side with these corporations. Well, let's hear from Matt Weaver. He's a rail worker, and I think he put it best. Weaver noted that Congress could choose to force the railroads to accept an agreement more beneficial towards workers. Quote, I'd like to see a lot of pressure from Congress on the carriers, he said, but they have a lot of money, they lobby a lot, and do some campaign finance work that we just can't afford. So in other words, because these rail corporations have all the money, well, in our capital a system that also directly translates into them having all of the power as well. Now, people may try to defend Biden and claim that, you know, he really had no choice. His hand was forced here. But he wasn't taking the stance before. As More Perfect Union points out via Twitter, in 1992, Senator Joe Biden voted against ending a major rail strike. He argued that by intervening, Congress would be rewarding the railroad companies for years of bad faith negotiation. Yesterday, President Biden asked Congress to intervene to prevent a rail strike. They continue, as a senator, Biden criticized intervention from Congress and the White House, saying it assured the rail companies that the odds were stacked in their favor and confirmed the fears of rail workers. And now decades later, as president... He's continuing to stack the deck in favor of these corporations against workers. Now, let's get to some reactions here because, expectedly, um, workers were really pissed about this. Rail Workers United tweeted, This is a legacy-defining moment for Joe Biden. He is going down as one of the biggest disappointments in labor history. Labor reporter Jonah Furman writes, Full sellout from the White House for the majority of rail workers who rejected the deal the president brokered, preemptively denying them the right to strike. This was the which side are you on moment, and the White House chose the railroad bosses. Railroad worker Ross Gruders writes, When railroads refuse to give us sick time, what they're saying is their profits are more important than their workers and the national economy economy. Hold the railroads accountable. Tell your elected leaders to give railroad workers the sick time they need or let them strike. Congressman Jamal Bowman writes, if Congress is going to force rail workers to only have three scheduled unpaid sick days per year, I think every congressperson should start the 118th Congress with three unpaid sick days that have to be scheduled 30 days in advance. Congresswoman AOC writes, Railroad workers grind themselves to the bone for this country as their labor produces billions for Wall Street. They demand the basic dignity of paid sick days. I stand with them. If Congress intervenes, it should be to have workers' backs and secure their demands in legislation. Well said. But it seems like the opposite is happening. Joe Biden is calling on Congress to intervene to do what the corporations want and not give the workers what they desperately need, which is paid sick time. So I'll leave that there. Um, I'm not necessarily sure at this point in time if a strike happens, but because Joe Biden is signaling that he will be intervening and is calling on Congress to intervene, I'd argue that the strike is unlikely now, although there is the possibility of a wildcat strike, which is a strike not sanctioned by the unions. But either way, this incredible uh, this story is uh, incredible because it just demonstrates how when push comes to shove, regardless of how tough presidents and Democrats talk, they always end up siding with large multinational corporations, with the billionaire class, with the elites who screw over workers. And it's just really disgusting. Uh, you know, it's not surprising, but it still is disgusting nonetheless, because we need at least one of the two major parties to at least side with workers a little bit. But we can't even get tepid support for workers here. And that's just really infuriating to me. You know You know the, you know the thing, thing, thing. You're getting nervous, man, man.